function is at least the same. Uh, so in this uh, sprite uh, we test, but perhaps the most important part of the morning session, uh, around table discussions using peer reviews as a basis of SAI's performance. Uh, this part uh, will be hosted by two colleagues representing the Supreme Audit Institution of the European Union, the European Court of Auditors. Uh, the first one is Mr. Jeffrey Simpson, on my left, uh, Director of Audit Quality Control. He is a chartered accountant uh, as professional, and after qualifying with a major audit firm in London, and then working for them in Luxembourg, uh, 26 years ago he obtained a position at the European Court of Auditors. Is true? Oh, that's true. Yeah. Good. I can't deny it. Well, uh, in addition to many other main duties, he has took part in five peer reviews on other SAIs, and he been involved through the two review on the European Court of Auditors. Today, an uh, important part of his duties is connected with the role of the court as vice chair of InterSize Professional Standards Committee. Uh, as uh, he declared, Jeffrey appreciates professional decisions based on informed rationality and logic and dislike those based on supposition, prejudice and personal interest. Well, very nice words. I agree. I can declare the same. Uh, the second colleague from the court is uh, Wilfred Aquilina. Uh, his professional CV is also very broad. Uh, for example, uh, for nine years he was responsible for the delivery of performance audits on a broad range of topics at the SAI of Malta. He also established and headed the internal audit and control functions of an EU body based in Brussels for several years. As he declared, he likes the international dimension of the current job and working on projects that focus on critical organizational cross-cutting issues. He dislikes working without clear goals and expectations. Once more, I can support your thinking. So, Jeffrey and Wilfred, the floor is yours and my mission is finished. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um Jacek, you've actually said much of what I was going to say as, uh, by way of introduction. Um, yeah, I've been involved in five peer reviews, I think, or even six. Um, and the first of these was around about the year 2000, um, which was actually on the, the Slovak Psi. So there's a certain symmetry to 20, nearly 20 years later coming back here to um, present um, our experience, uh, in fact, on, uh, on, on peer reviews. I've always found peer reviews to be fascinating exercises to take part in. Um, not only the insight you get to the organization you're reviewing, but also the insight you get onto your colleagues on the team. Um, and I seem to remember that we probably spent as much time discussing between team members about our understanding of things as we did get to, you know, discussing the uh, um, the, uh, the side that we were um, we were, re were reviewing. Um, as Jacek said, I was involved in two of the peer reviews that we've had on the ECA. Um, these were also fascinating exercises, but perhaps for slightly different reasons. Um, and we've got a third peer review coming up. I'm looking at Amit there, who's uh, one of the brave people that will be working on, the, working on that. Um, another aspect of peer review that um, we've been involved in, myself and Wilfred, which is, I think is why we're sitting up here um, today, is that we were um, quite significantly involved in the rewrite of the SI 5600, the revision of the 5600 on, on peer reviews, which we found a very cathartic that's the right word, sorry for the interpreters for that, um, experience. 
Um, but rereading the ESI, I think it has a number of points in there which I think um, are worth emphasizing, uh, particularly at the start of these, um, these one and a half days on peer reviews. So I'm going to ask um, Wilfred to perhaps explain some of the main points of that. But before, could we just have the slides? Was it possible to have the slides? The second one, please. Um, okay. So this is what we'll be doing up until, up until lunchtime. Um, Wilfred will be going through some, some of the key elements of 5,600. Um, there will be then time, or well, then we will have round table discussions, which is convenient. You're only actually at round tables, so that's uh, part of the problem um, solved, actually. Um, and we will, be, we will be asking you to consider one of three questions, and we will tell you which of the questions that you will be looking at um, a little bit later. Um, and then we will, we will have some feedback from the, uh, from the tables, um, from the subgroups, and then we will have a little bit of a, a little wrap-up. And also, I think we'll have the opportunity for, for questions and comments, um, um, so we can have, a, a, hopefully, a lively session which produces some interesting, interesting conclusions. Um, so I will now ask Wilfred to... Um, tell us a little bit about the main features of 5,600 and um, how they impact a little bit on what we've been, what we we are discussing over the next um, two days, and uh, and you know the practical, some of the practical points about peer reviews. Thank you, Wolf. Uh, hello, uh, thank you, Jeffrey. Um, so what I what I what I'm going to be doing is basically walk you through SI 5,600. Okay. Some of you might be already familiar with this, but since it's a mixed audience, uh, it's always good to refresh as well some of the key elements that went into it. Uh, this is the result of quite a lot of feedback that we got when we were designing the, the SI. And also um, using a bit also the experience that the European Court of Auditors had uh, conducting peer reviews and being reviewed as well. So uh, just go quickly through it, um, highlighting certain key points. And the first thing, it's, it's, I'm following the same structure of the SI, so it might be easier as well when you go home or after the meeting, uh, have a look at it, you, you'll see the same similarity as well. And the first key point I would like to highlight is the definition itself. Uh, and there are certain words there. I mean, everything has been weighed carefully when we're stating it. Uh, first of all, it has to be external. So we're talking about a peer review. It's quite obvious, but it's a very important criteria. And it has to be independent, so it, there has to be that independent uh, uh, element to it. The other thing is that you might be looking at a very specific element of the organization, or you could be looking at a number of elements. I'll go more in detail, Dragos as well mentioned the, uh, the uh, point of, on the scope, and I'll go more in detail into that as well. The third point is that it's a, a group of professional peers, so it's a professional um, external review. And it could be done by one SAI, so they're being practiced. I mean, we've all seen uh, different peer reviews. So uh, it could be one SAI doing a peer review on other SAI, or it could be a group of SAIs doing it together, or people from different SAIs doing it together on one peer review. In some cases, as is mentioned also in the guidance, you could have a non-SAI organization as well participating in the peer review. So that's also another option that one could consider as well. Um, the next point I'd like to highlight is that um, this is not an audit, uh, and this is something that probably needs to be well communicated, understood even internally, so even when, when the peer review is being carried out. This is more of peers coming, being invited, being voluntarily uh, accepting as well to come into the organization and assessing it from an external independent view using also their professional background, experience and expertise. So this is not intended as an audit. As I will say later on as well, you use, one does use all the techniques, obviously we're auditors, so we can apply all the techniques and methods that we use in auditing, but it's not intended purely as a rigorous audit exercise. Um, as well, the peers that are provided by the SAI are seen as acting what we call their ad personam, which basically means acting on their own professional in their own professional capacity, and what they're doing is not binding their SAI, because that could be also one concern uh, some, some participants might have. So. This participation is on an individual basis. Obviously, people are drawn from the participating SAIs, 
And I'll go more into detail as well in the Memorandum of, of Understanding, which uh, defines this in more detail. Okay. Um, I'm going to the next element in the SI 5600, and this covers the strategic considerations. Um, SI 5600 is basically suggesting very clearly that the first thing that one has to look at is uh, what is it, what is the peer review going to be uh, giving back to us? I mean, we heard the point before about how much does it cost, how much does it pay? At the end of the day, there has to be a benefit or a, an outcome linked to this exercise, which is going to use a lot of the resources of the organization, both the organizer being reviewed, but also of the participating uh, SAI. So this issue is definitely an important point to keep in mind. And this needs, as you could even see from the presentation we already heard, that you need to do some sort of either gap analysis, you need to do some sort of self-assessment using this IPMF uh, assessment model, etc. So the more tools that you use to identify where do we stand and what we want to achieve with this, you can then start going into the process of identifying the best or the more ideal partners to do the exercise. So there are two aspects here. First, deciding internally or agreeing internally what needs to be done, having this as clearly as possible. But then also using that to identify which are the key or the best place the peer review size and, and individuals in those size who would be able to help in this exercise. So it's quite a systematic, like any other uh, assessment, it's quite a systematic uh, process that one needs to adopt. Uh, and then also, as well, we need to identify what we need to focus on, what are the objectives behind it, what are the uh, priorities that we want to achieve, is it the right time? I mean, there are a lot of things, I'm not, I'm not going into detail intentionally, but I suggest you read ISI 5600 to get a full view of this. And then also, you need to manage expectations. Um, automatically, you might be communicating to Parliament, uh, you might be communicating internally, uh, that there's a peer review, so there are expectations. So managing those expectations, making it clear what exactly is being done, is very important to everyone, it's, it's all leading to the same process. Uh, this is very, very important, especially when it comes also to uh, the final report or the final assessment, that this is what were people uh, um, expecting to be reviewed, etc. Okay, so the next step leading to this is obviously the partners, and then obviously need the resources. Uh, I'll start with the resources. Uh, definitely one needs to be very uh, aware of the time needed. I mean, it's gonna take a lot of time from already very busy people in your organization. They have to leave other work to work on this, but there's obviously the much uh, added value behind this, which is obviously the benefit you can gain from having someone external bring in all that expertise or experience uh, and be able to discuss with them as well. The other thing is obviously the partners, and the, peer, the SI 5600 gives a, a number of uh, criteria that one should look at uh, uh, for. It could be a lot of different reasons. I can just quickly um, give a hint on this, so it will be easier to follow. But basically, it would be looking at, at, the different, uh, at the different experience, expertise, the resources that are available in the, in the reviewing organization, the language, uh, how we're able to com communicate with that, the structure. We even heard a bit this morning the distance sometimes could be a factor as well. Not someone from another completely different uh, geographic region it could be a factor. And even the background of the SAI, what type of model of uh, uh, that could be a, something to work, keep in consideration as well. So, and then there's also the concept of the lead reviewer, which I mentioned there as well. If you're having more than one SAI participating in the review, the lead reviewer is definitely a key person for the whole uh, coordination and also for communicating and making sure everything is well understood by the other peers in that peer review team. So there's a key role of peer reviewer, which the SI 5600 also mentions. And it also could be the key person who signs the MOU with the, the SI of the, the leading reviewer from the SI, would be the one who signs the MOU with the, with the reviewed organization. So I, I can go to the other. Uh, when it comes to human resource as well, it's very important to set an internal team to uh, coordinate peer review, allocate enough resources for this, whatever uh, needs to, measures need to be done. There is a whole section on the MOU, and there are a number of, we pose a number of questions there. So ticking those, answering those questions, making sure these are adequately covered in the MOU is also a very good way of ensuring that you have a, a fruitful and successful um, peer review. The, uh, the MOU should obviously cover what are the rights. I mean, it's all based on trust. It's all based on, on already an understanding between the different participating peers. But at the same time, you need to have this sort of document which sort of guides or even structures the whole exercise. 
it's very important because it might end up being a, and obviously this should be signed before the peer review starts as well. Uh, and it includes also the different elements like the scope, approach, etc., which should lead from the other stages that we mentioned before as well. Uh, we're emphasizing a lot in the standard as well the planning. And by planning, we mean a very detailed planning, uh, not just a simple overall view. And in the planning, there's a clear identification of what work needs to be done, the approach, uh, whether we need to speak to the, the peers, we need to speak to different stakeholders, external stakeholders, how this will be uh, achieved, what type of uh, methodology we'll be using, whether it's um, walkthrough testing, whether we're asking for a sample of files, etc. So you'll find all these hints in the, in the, in the guidance itself. Uh, and as well, it comes to the feedback itself. As I said before, this is referring more, this is a more of an exercise where we're, we're, we've been invited inside the organization as peers and that we are giving our insights and, uh, and uh, making sure we understood exactly what are the, identifying what are the key issues and what can be improved or strengthened. That's what we've been asked to do. Uh, yes, and obviously I, we emphasize a lot at the very bottom there is the communication. And it's the same thing like an audit, no? So you have the opening meeting, you have the feedback, you are, there's no surprise approach, so you're communicating uh, and building information. There's also the process of closing the, audit, the uh, peer review report, etc. So a lot of things are familiar with what you, we do already as, as auditors. And uh, there's a, obviously there's a, the point that after all, this exercise is the report. And the report needs to be clear, well-conceived, well-structured. I won't go in detail on this, but, but it's very obvious. But obviously this is uh, the main tool that will be used both after for the follow-up and for the implementation of the results, but even externally. And I'll go more into that when it comes to publication. The important thing as well is obviously the quality of recommendations, which is always the main, I mean, you have to have sound conclusions and sound observations, but also the recommendations are usually that added value that gives you the um, benefit uh, of having done this whole exercise and what, was the, what is the end, final outcome of this. And there should be enough time for the, what I call their clearance, you could call it meet, closing meeting, whatever, between the peers and, and, uh, and the, uh, the uh, peer-reviewed organization where these things are discussed, maybe the facts are verified, etc. So that's, that's the, no, the whole process. And then finally, it's obviously a good practice to publish. There are different ways of publishing. You can publish the whole report, you can publish a summary of the report, but, uh, but obviously when you're talking about here accountability, transparency, and things we obviously emphasize a lot with our own oddities, this is something we should be doing ourselves as well. So this is a guidance, obviously we recommend it's a good practice, but there are obviously the benefits behind all this. Uh, then obviously comes the more difficult part maybe. Uh, it's actually implementing what the peer review says. And this is where the organization needs to respond, needs to have its own uh, action plan, ideally, with its own clear actions of what needs to be done. Uh, and this would obviously lead to the, what is, after all, what the whole thing was all about, no? Strengthening and improving the, the activities of the Supreme Order Institution. So obviously having a proper say project management of the action plan, proper follow-up of the action plan is critical. And one could also consider then inviting again the peers to verify, to have an independent external verification of what has been uh, implemented. So there you even closing the whole loop up to the end. And uh, at the end, obviously, it's always, it might even be useful to report back to our stakeholders, to the parliament, etc., what we've done with the peer review results, especially if we've published the peer review. That's sort of... I try to summarize very quickly. I hope I didn't go too fast. If there are any questions, I know it uh, might be useful uh, if there are any questions or I could walk, go back to a certain slide, feel free. The idea is to give you an insight of what went behind the drafting of the SI 5600.